know you've been doing that, but I'd like to just hear myself say it. Praise God. Because he's worthy of praise. Amen. Well, we have a, as you can tell by my voice, we had a wonderful time last night. Amen. And, uh, and God has really moved. And the word does it. Amen. Amen. I, I told somebody I can really preach anything. Now, we want to preach what God gives us, but really, any, anywhere in the Bible we can preach, yeah. and it will cause you to get the Holy Ghost, it will Amen. cause you to be delivered, Hallelujah. it will cause you, your marriages to be strengthened, anything. I can preach on Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews, or I can preach on Jezebel and Ahab, amen, and, and Pete, the word, because Mark sixteen twenty says, they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. Amen. God's working with us this morning. Amen. The Lord working with them, Amen. confirming Hallelujah. the word with signs following. Hallelujah. And so if we can get one verse of scripture out of our mouth, we will have signs and miracles. Praise God. Because it's guaranteed. He said, if you'll preach the word, I'll work with you. And, and I'll confirm my word. How will I do that? I'll show you my word is true because I'm going to heal your cancer. I'm going to set you free. I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to feed you with the Holy Ghost. That's how we know the word is true today. Praise God. I remember uh, I wrote down that uh, old Bud Robinson was a holiness preacher that went to New York City, just a country boy. And they took him to New York City. And uh, he said, when I got there, he said, I saw all the, the Empire State Building. I've been to New York City, preached in, just across the line in, in uh, New, uh, West New York, New Jersey, and, and, uh, and looked across at Manhattan. And then we went over there. And I, I like New York City. I like going there. But... But Robinson said, when I got to the hotel that night to pray, he said, I thank God for letting me see all the sights of New York City. But more than anything, I wanted to thank the Lord that I didn't see anything I wanted. Hallelujah. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me to heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Friend, we don't want to put our roots down too strongly in this world. Because I know myself that a lot of times we don't hurry the coming of the Lord because we're satisfied. We're happy. We've got everything that we want for the most part. Other than Ross Perot's bank account or Donald Trump's bank account. But other than that, we, we're happy. We, we like our Buick Roadmaster. We like our Buick Saber. We like all these things that we drive and our families. We love our families. We want to spend more time with them. But ultimately, we need to cry. We don't cry this anymore very much like the early church cried. When they greeted one another, they didn't say, Hey, Doc, what's happening, Bishop? Praise God. Amen, uh, Pastor. They, they would say, Maranatha! When they parted, when they met, which meant, Hallelujah. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. That's how they greeted one another. Right, Jeremy? Is that right? You're looking at me kind of funny. I don't know. Maybe you... He's a studier, so he might have researched that out and found that different. i got to check. Hallelujah. But Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus, because they're greeting. And so I'm so thankful. I've met people in the read. I'm not going to preach a lot. I always say that, but lately I asked my wife, how long did I preach last night? She said, 45 minutes. I used to be good for 20 or 30 minutes. I'm getting long-winded in my old age. So i got to cut my preliminaries a little short, maybe. I used to talk a lot of preliminaries because I knew I wasn't going to preach long. But... Uh, Anyway, we, we are just we're just so thrilled and blessed to be here today. Amen. To be in this powerful church. Amen. John Wesley said, Anything that cools my love for Christ is the world. Amen. 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 Whatever it is. Anything right. that cools my love for Christ. John Wesley also was invited by Samuel Adams one day, the great American statesman. He was invited to supper one night. And, and which was would have been a great honor for anybody to, to be able to go to Samuel Adams' house. And, and they said that uh, John Wesley denied the request to come because he said he thought it would keep him up too late and he couldn't get up for his 4 o'clock prayer meeting. And so he turned that invitation down. I'm just trying to talk about commitment today and that we need to look at things differently than we ever have before because this world will grab us and it will distract us. And friend, it doesn't matter if we if we die broke and don't have anything to our name. If we know that when we get to the end of our life that we've kept Jesus in our heart. Hallelujah. We don't have to hang our head if we, if we don't have a lot. Amen. We don't have to look at people with envy. I thank God for people. I wrote on Facebook the other day, Megan Kelly on Fox News, who is one of my favorite commentators. 
when they were talking about Sandy coming through New York and New Jersey. She's from that area. And Megan Kelly, one of my favorite commentators, said, she said, now folks, she said, now this area right here in New Jersey was hit really hard. And she called out the, the, the place. She knew it very well. You could tell. She said, and she said, but, and these are just common people. These are, these are not yes, rich hallelujah. people. And I thought to myself, Megan, rich people have photo albums too. Rich people have heirlooms that were passed down from their grandmother too. Why, 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 do, we, why do we want to disrespect the rich? Amen. Amen, amen. amen. I'm not there. I'm not defending myself because I'm not rich. Praise God. I don't even know if I'm middle class anymore. Hallelujah. But I know one thing. I've got a mansion just over the hill. I feel the Holy Ghost this morning, folks. I'm trying to say we don't have to feel deprived. The most... Lowest paid individual in this place today is a brother and a sister in the Lord, and they can say, Thank God I'm on the same level. Because, listen, God has built me a mansion. Hallelujah. And, and I've got that. Amen. So I'm with Bud Robinson. I didn't see one thing I wanted in New York City. Amen. Praise God. The atheist boy. Was uh, walking down the road one day, and or, or the the Christian boy was walking down the road one day, and the atheist looked at him, and he said, "Son, I'll give you an orange if you can tell me where God is." And the and the young atheist boy said, "Mister, I'll give you two apples if you can tell me where he ain't." <laughs> hallelujah! <laughs> and oh, in that in that wisdom from a young boy, Hallelujah! He's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's everywhere. He's all knowing. Hallelujah! He's all powerful. All of it. That's the God you serve today. Amen. That's the God you serve today. Well, just before I preach, I've got a word from the Lord for this church today. And I've got a lot of scriptures, not a lot of commentary. You know, we make these notes, uh, and but you can tell by the way I walk around and scream and yell and all that. I don't look at my notes a lot. But uh, we make these notes, and sometimes they're worth sticking with because we don't really want to leave out some of the things that we've typed in. Because God spoke to me while I was typing. Amen. And he said, this is for Sweetwater 2012. We're almost into 2013 now. Oh, and so I've got a word for you today from the Lord that I know is from the Lord. Amen. Amen. And so uh, I'm just thankful that we'll get to share that with you today. Just before we do, we got a little commercial break. Uh, I wrote, uh, my doctoral dissertation was, was on this book here. And I wrote it in a way to where it would be, it would transfer easily into a book. I just had to make a few changes. So I've got my book that came out this year. It's called Solving the Mystery of the Elusive Will of God. Hallelujah. How many has ever wondered where you're supposed to be, what you're supposed to be doing, what your ministry is, what, how to fit into the kingdom of God? Hallelujah. That's plagued most preachers, Pastor Jeremy. Is, is many, I, mean, I spent a lot of my life, I wasted a lot of time in my young ministry because I said, am I supposed to pastor over here? Am I supposed to go over there? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? I, I turned down my first church in Bochita, Oklahoma when I was about 20 years old. I think I wasn't over 20. And uh, and I told them, I said, now I want to sneak up there to Bochita. I don't want them to know who I am. Not that anybody would know me, but they had heard my name as maybe a potential person that would want this church in Bochita. And so I, I, an old couple took us up there that night in 19, probably 84, somewhere around there. And uh, let's see, I was, yeah, about 1984. And so we went up there and we thought we were sneaking in, got their legs, sat down on the back row, and the pastor, the interim pastor, he was an interim pastor, uh, he said, his name was Brother Henson, he said, you must be Brother Kathy. Now how he knew that, I don't know. He said, come up and preach. Well, friend, I preached the lousiest message you ever heard in your life. I don't remember to this day what it was. I just knew that it was a terrible message as far as my delivery of it. And so that evening, now remember, I just talk. I don't know where I'm going with this. I don't know why I'm saying what I say. I just let God lead me as I go here. And so the, I saw the people gather up at the back of the building, Pastor. And, and, and he came up to me and said, Brother Kathy, they just voted you in. I said, these people are desperate. I mean, that was a, I was so bored, I almost went to sleep. And so... I said, well, brother, i got to pray about this. That's our escape route, isn't it? We always say, i got to pray. Amen. Amen. You know, that's our way of saying, I ain't coming, baby. Right. And so I, I, I went home and prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed for months. And finally I said, Lord, I was frustrated. I was, I was just sick over even thinking about it. But they, those people threw me into where I had to make a choice. Right. 
when they voted me in that night. And he was an interim pastor, Brother Henson. He wanted out of there so bad he couldn't stand it. And, uh, and so finally I said, Lord, you've got to show me what I'm supposed to do. And uh, so uh, should I go to Oklahoma or not? Me and my wife are at Preston Wood Mall in Dallas. And we get on an elevator. And the elevator door shut. The two halves of the door, they came together. And on the written in big letters, scratched in with a pen, was Oklahoma. I said, that couldn't have been God. And, and so for years, I turned down church after church after church. That wasn't the first church. I turned down nine churches in, in the state. And I wasn't looking for a church, really. But nine people kept coming to me. I was sitting with my accountant. In a, in a Chinese restaurant one day, he's a good friend of mine, and, and I was sitting with him and I said, Mickey, I'm so frightened. I was about to backslide over this. I felt so like I wasn't doing what God called me to do, but yet I kept turning people down. And, and finally I said, Mickey, I cannot go anywhere without somebody wanting me to pastor a church. And a woman walked up to our table when I said that. A woman that I've known since 1975 said, Brother Kathy, Rick just lost his church. You need to go to New Braunfels and save that church. You need to go pastor that church. I can get you in there. My accountant like to pass down at the table. He said, you just told me you can't go in here. We're in a Chinese restaurant and they're trying to get you to pastor. <laughs> Amen. So I found out the secret of the elusive will of God in my lifetime through all of that turmoil. And so I wrote the book, Solving the Mystery of the Elusive Will of God. Pastor Jeremy gave me permission to tell you about it because I really, not because I want the money, though I'll take it. <laughs> you know, Zig Ziglar said, money's not everything, but it ranks up there with oxygen. <laughs> Praise God. No, but we, we just, we use this to travel on, and I'm not trying, don't buy this thing if you don't want it. But if you can, if you are one that's wrestled with the will of God, then, then I have these with me. My wife's got them over there. I do take credit card. I got Square on my iPhone. So we take credit cards today, and, and I appreciate your things on that. I, feel, I told you, Nate, God gave me this. I sat down and it, took, it only took me a month and a half to write my dissertation. Because every time I'd come home, I'd sit down and I'd type for three or four hours and it just flowed. I just would type and type and type. I know it was from the Lord and so it, it will help you. So after service, you can see me and uh, my lovely assistant will help you get a book. Praise God. Good to have my wife with me. She has to work early in the morning. She gets up at 6.30, opens her daycare at 7.00. And works till 6 o'clock that night. And she has to go home tonight. And we have to clean that daycare to get ready for the morning. And But I just can't hardly leave her behind anymore. I used to leave her behind when I would come preach a night service. I'd say, Pastor, I, I can only preach in the morning if you want Janine to come. Uh, but but I can't preach a night service. So here she is. And she's going to sleep in her reclining chair in the Buick on the way home. <laughs> Praise God. But it's great to be here. And... Uh, I want to minister what the Lord gave me to you and thank Pastor Thompson and Andrew and everybody for blessing us with a nice place to stay while we were here and the good fellowship and, and fellowship last night after service was wonderful. But I want to talk to you. This might be a little preaching today. That's a mixture of teaching and preaching. And that's what Pastor does on Sunday morning. He preaches because I know he screams and yells probably when he's... I know him well enough to know that. He probably... He can teach, but he, he, he likes to throw in a little of that preaching also. So the book of Haggai, that's somewhere in the Old Testament. Praise God. It's one of them books that you got to look at the page number probably to find it. But Haggai, the second chapter, verse 18 and 19. I'm going to read from about three different versions where we can get the point here. But, uh, but anyway, Haggai 2, 18 through 19. Consider now. From this day. That's why I told you last night it was critical that I preach it on the day that God wanted me to preach it. Amen. Yeah, you can stand. That's good, brother. Praise God. Hallelujah. Consider now from this day upward. From the four and twentieth day of the ninth month. Boy, he was specific. He said, I got a word for you, Israel. And I'm going to tell you the day that it's going to happen. And I want you to... Listen to me, because from this day forward, the 20th day of the ninth month, even from this day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. He said it again. Is the seed yet in the barn? Question mark. Yea, yes. The seed's still in the barn. You haven't even planted your crops yet. 
And he said, As yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree have not brought forth, there's no buds on the trees yet to see if there's going to be a crop. He said, So from this day forth, I want you to consider this. You haven't planted your field. Your pomegranate tree leaves have not bloomed. There's no fruit that is evident on your trees. <laughs> Hallelujah. He said, from this day, I'm going to bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. That's a word for sweet water today. This day, right here, the 11th of November, 2012, God said, you have no indication of how the crops are going to do this year, but I just want to tell you before you even think about it, I'm going to bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you be seated for just a moment because I'm going to read out the Message Bible. Pastor, would you go ahead and pray over this and we'll read. Praise God. Jesus. Amen. The message Bible says, now think ahead from this same date. He said this 24th day of the ninth month, think ahead from when the temple rebuilding was launched. That was the key. They built, they launched the temple rebuilding. Has anything in your field, your vine, your fig trees, your palm granite, your olive tree failed to flourish? From now on, you can count on a blessing. Oh, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said in the New Living Translation, think about this 18th day of December, the day when the rebuilding of the Lord's temple began. Think carefully. He wants us to be sober in this. He wants us to take seriously what this preacher is about to say to you today. Because he says if you will hear him and you will listen to my word, then your life is going to be blessed from here out. Amen. Who wants that today? Does anybody want that today? To know that you're going to be blessed. To know that your knees are going to be reformed. To know that God is going to touch your marriage today. To know that God is going to touch your children and your grandchildren. Man, Grandma Bohal. Amen. To know that. Praise God. He said to consider this. Has anything in your fields. Praise God. He said. I'm, I'm sorry. I was going back to the other. He said. Think carefully. I'm giving you a promise. Now while the seed is still in the barn. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh I'm not just laughing grin through this whole thing, praise God, because I'm going to receive this blessing today. Amen. He said, while the trees, while the seed is still in the barn, you have not yet harvested your grain and your grapevines, your fig trees, your palm granites, and your olive trees have not yet produced their crop, but from this day onward, I will bless you. Your blessings have seemed to be slim to non-existent, some of you up to this point. It seems like trial after trial after trial. Uh, bombard you. I preach a message everywhere I go and I love to preach it. I might allude to it tonight that faith is easy but patience is tough. I've preached that here, Pastor. Amen. How God said it's easy to every man is given the measure of faith. You don't have to do anything to get faith. God planted enough faith in your heart to get you saved. That's right. That's right. Hallelujah. He gave you just enough to get saved by and then once you get saved then you begin to hunger for the Word of God and, and the Word of God becomes important to you and your faith grows because the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So you want to know how to increase your faith? You're coming to church on Sunday morning. It was a little tough. Right. I told my wife, oh, I groaned and moaned as I was getting off of that, off of that bed today in the hotel room. I'm like, I was going, oh, oh. As, as I began to straighten up all these achy bones and hips, you know, get the, oh, oh. You know, and I mean, and finally I looked at her about 30 minutes into that groaning, and I said, I'm so sorry that I'm so negative and hurting so bad, and, and all you're hearing out of me is, ouch, oh, oh, as I get out of that bed, amen. Oh, but friend, I've come to tell Sweetwater, Texas today. I'm so glad God gave me this message for Sweetwater, because this is a church I love. This is a people that I love. Amen. And so God has said to you today, from this day forth, don't worry about it. You say, but I haven't even planted my crops yet. There's not even any blooms on the palm granite. That's okay, because see, God requires of us faith. And so God, by faith, said, I know what you're going to do with this. And before you plant one seed, I've got enough faith in you, Sweetwater, to know that you're going to be blessed. Hallelujah. You are going to be blessed. 
above measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. God will even cause men to give unto your bosoms. Amen. I'll never forget when I pulled out of the driveway. You see, there's times when I prophesy to people, and God didn't tell me to prophesy. It's just that, like I think Pastor quoted last night, Romans 4, 17, that Abraham called those things that were not as though they were. Abraham did that. Yeah. Abraham would, would prophesy to gas tanks and camels. It was camels in his day. You know, he'd say, I need another camel. Pastor Jeremy said last night, I need some gas in my camel. <laughs> and so he prophesied to a gas tank. And said, I need more gas. Praise God. Abraham would look and say, I need another camel. And it would, bam, there would, a Bedouin Amen. would lose a camel on the way walking across the land of Israel. And Abraham would say, there's a camel. Don't have a brand on it. The Bedouin's long gone. I needed that camel. I'm just telling you today, folks, that as I pulled out of my driveway one day, I had a preacher with me. And I pulled out and I said, the check's in the mail, Johnson. And he said, what? I said, I'm fixing to pull up to my mailbox and there's going to be a check in the mail. He said, you're crazy, Kathy. What do you mean? I said, he said, you give an IRS check or something? And I said, no, I don't have a clue what I'm talking about. I just know the check's in the mail. And so I pulled up to my mailbox and I rolled down the window. And he's on the passenger side. And I, and I pulled up in that big old Ford Econ line van. And I reached down to my mailbox and I opened it up. And there's a, not the old Citibank pre-typed bill. But there was a handwritten letter to Sonny Kathy. And I opened it up, and there was, I think it was a thousand dollar check in that envelope that a lady just felt impressed to send me. And he went, How did you do that? I said, I just knew in my spirit that God had just blessed me. Amen. I just knew it. I knew in my spirit. And there are people that I had prophesied over, Pastor. And I said, You're going to get a bonus. This week, God wants you to know it's Him, so He's going to give it to you this week. And then praise the Lord and say, There it came! Hallelujah. That same man called me and he told me, He said, I guess I'm going to have to leave Fort Worth. He said, I have a great carpet business, but he said, I'm telling you right now, I cannot get a job. I can't pay somebody to give me a job to lay carpet. And, and I said, And the Spirit of the Lord came on me, and I said, Johnson, your phone's going to begin to ring. And before, in just a little while, because God wants you to know it's Him, you're going to have so much business, you won't believe it. He called me 45 minutes later, and he said, Brother, I am booked up for four months. Every, every carpet store in Fort Worth has been calling me, and I finally had to stop and say, I can't lay any more carpet. <laughs> Praise God. 45 minutes later. He said, how did you do that? I said, it's God, brother. I'm telling you right now, I know I'm talking a lot about money today, but that's not what I'm trying to get at. I'm going to talk a lot about money, but your blessings come in many forms. And God said today, I am going to bless you, Sweetwater, while the seed is still in the barn. Hallelujah. 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 Why? Because God has faith Amen. that you're going to receive the word. Hallelujah. Amen. But it's contingent on you receiving the word and obeying. Uh-oh, I just lost half the congregation. No. Amen, I know you're going to believe it. But it's contingent on obedience. God wants you to receive the blessings in your life today, but you will have to act differently. Hallelujah. This is a word of faith on God's part because He trusts us, Brother Chapman, to receive the word. I was getting ready to come and get this message prepared and somebody from a 318 area code sends me a morning scripture every morning. I have no clue what it is, but it's a Louisiana uh, area code. And this, this was the scripture as I was preparing this message. It said, Brethren, I count not myself to have uh, apprehended, but this one thing I do, Paul said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind yeah. and reaching forth Unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God. One version says, I am bearing down on my goal. Yeah. Hallelujah. Haggai said, look to the future. From this day forth, 
when the temple of God's foundations was laid from this day forth. Folks, in this service today, we're going to begin to lay a foundation because the Bible says, Know ye not that you are the temple of God. That's right. Amen. Hallelujah. That word temple, he said, Know ye not that you're the temple of God. Hallelujah. That word temple in the, in the Greek is the word naos. When he was talking about you, he said, you are the naos of God. And that word naos means not the court of the Gentiles, not the court of the women, not the outer court, but it means the holy of holies. I, I want you to see that today. You're not just any somebody today. The Bible called you the holy of holies, where the Ark of the Covenant is, where God's present lives, where His name dwells. Hallelujah. You are the holy of holies, the naos. And so what did they do in Haggai's day? When, they, when, when Haggai came back to Jerusalem and Nehemiah built the walls, each one of them had their commission, but Haggai's job was to lay the foundation of the temple and to be, rebuild Solomon's temple. Amen. And when they did that, he said, this day because you laid a foundation in your future and in your life because you thought enough of God to say, I'm going to rebuild what the walls that have fallen down. God said, because you've done that from this day forth, before you have time to even plant a crop, before you have time to get a new job, before you have time to do anything, I have, I'm pronouncing upon you a blessing. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, you're ble- look at your neighbor and say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed, sister. I'm blessed today. Not future tense. Not when I get a raise on my job. Not when, not when uh, things start looking better, but right now before they look better. Right now. Before they look better. Hallelujah. I'm going to go out every day and I'm going to say, I'm blessed. Amen. I'm blessed. I know I'm blessed. Yeah. Hallelujah. Oh, it feels good to preach a message like this. And to know it's a word from God for this church. This church right here. Amen. An Israeli doctor I was listening to, every now and then I'll listen to NPR. <laughs> Amen. I was listening to NPR, and an Israeli doctor has done research on, you know, I just read to you, Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind. And I'll tell you about the Israeli doctor in a minute, but I want to tell you something the Lord spoke to me one time. He said, Sonny, I don't want you to only forget the bad things that are behind you. He said, I want you to forget the victories. And I said, Lord, what are you talking about? Forget the victories. And he said, because what you're going to do is you're going to say, I remember in 1980 when all the gifts of the Spirit were operating in my life. And I couldn't walk past anybody that had a demon without that demon manifesting and me casting it out. I couldn't preach anywhere without somebody receiving the Holy Ghost. So what happens is I'm remembering the victories. I'm looking back to 1980 when God wants to do much better than He did in 1980. And if I'm thinking about all the good things that happened in 1980 and why they're not happening now, then I've got a negative spirit on me when God wants me to do so much better than 1980. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. But we, we, He wants us to forget, not in thankfulness, but to forget in limitation even the victory, Sister Summer. Praise God, because God has so much better than that for us. So the Israeli doctor did research. When an Israeli does something, I perk my ears perk up. The first thing that happened when the World Trade Center came down, and I was standing in Hillcrest Hospital going to bend a job there, and I looked at people gathered around the te- television monitors in the lobby, and I said, what's happening? And I see the World Trade Center up in flames. And then we watched the other, the other uh, thing fly in. The first thing that came out of my mouth when I got home was I wish they would call the Israelis to come to the White House to tell them what to do about this act of terrorism. And so an Israeli doctor did research on the memory and he found out that immediately your memory of any emotional event is inaccurate. It's inaccurate. Because people that remember, they will, every time we think of Pastor Jeremy, we leave out a detail. Or we add in a detail. And, and then it just keeps growing. And get, 20 years later, this thing don't even hardly look like what we thought it was. But we're remembering that brother said this to me and bless God. And then you add to what else he did and then what he didn't even do it. You, 
you just keep adding to it or you take away. But if something you did wrong, you take it away. But if it's something they did to you, you add to it. And so this Israeli doctor said the purest form of memory comes from an amnesiac. Somebody that has lost their memory. And when they get their memory back because they've never rethought about it again, they are totally accurate on the event that took place in their life. And so Paul is telling us in Philippians, he's saying, I want you to be an amnesiac. I want you to totally forget those emotional upheavals in your life. And because if you don't, the consequence of it is you can't press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God. Hallelujah. This is good stuff. <laughs> Hallelujah. I used to, when I pastored, I, I'm serious, man. I know this out there, but, but I'd go look at the, I'd go in the bathroom after church. I'd say, you are, you're my favorite pastor. Because <laughs> it gets exciting when God gives you a word for the people that be pastor. When you know God has given you a word and you know that these precious people that you are shepherding are going to hear something good. And they're going to grow. It gets exciting. And for the record, this is this is one of my, out of a very small handful, this is one of my favorite pastors. You can ask him. I've told him on many occasions when he was just a young man, Jeremy, I have so much confidence in you. You are something else, man. I mean, he just stands up and preaches it like it is. He lets his yay be yay and his nay be nay. You don't have to wonder what Jeremy Thompson's thinking when he preaches because he just lays it on the line. Amen. And sometimes it seems blunt, but we need that in a pastor. We need some, how would you like your medical doctor? It's kind of like the old boy that went in for tests. He was feeling terrible and went in for tests and then he went on a five-month vacation. Yeah. And he came back and found his doctor. He said, Doc, what do you got for me? He said, Brother, I got good news and I got bad news. Which do you want first? He said, Well, give me the he said, give me the good news. He said, You got six months to live. He said, That's the good news? What's the bad news? He said, I've been trying to get a hold of you for five months. <laughs> Praise God. I've been trying you you died in a month, brother. Amen. Amen. But but Oh, to know that God, praise God, has raised up people in your lives, pastor in your life, that will tell you the truth in the emergent church days. In the days when people say everybody's going to be dumped into heaven before it's all over. That's what the emergent church says. Yeah. These young guys that are trying to be cool and preppy to preach. Amen. They're trying to be cool and preppy. And so they're watering down the gospel and they're saying everybody... It's universalism. Everybody, if you'll just hang on long enough in eternity, everybody's going to get dumped into heaven anyway. And my question to them is, why did he get beaten? Why did they crucify him? Why didn't the body tell Nicodemus, you've got to be born again if everybody's going to make it anyway? Yeah. That, would, that, would make, that would make a senseless act from a God that... It's not a senseless God. If he's, and I want everybody to make it. That's my heart. I want everybody to make it. But friend, you're not going to make it unless you're born again. And you're not going to make it unless you have preachers like this that will tell you exactly how the cow eats cabbage. And whatever that means. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. And you have that. Amen. But it feels good when you get that. And you get to tell people. Praise God. And so... He's saying you've, you've planted, there are things that you've planted. And you've got to now pray for crop failure. See, in other words, if you sow lust, you're going to reap lust. Yeah. Praise God. And the most amazing thing to me about folks, and this is an education right here, yeah. the thing that you think about most is what you're going to be. That's right. yeah. So if you're thinking, I can't sin today. Oh God, help me not to sin today. Don't help me not to... Now help me not to look at this or go there or do that. Guess what? You're going to sin. Because that's all you're thinking about. But if you get up and you think about, oh, Jesus. Oh, oh did you feel that? I just felt that. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. 
You're my day. You're my thoughts. Philippians says, if somebody can find it, Brother Andrew, if you can find it and put it on the screen, Philippians, where it says to think on these things. Google that real quick and try to get it up on the screen. Uh, whoever's working the screen back here, praise God, that brilliant young man. If you if you want to find someone on the computer, get a teenager. Hallelujah. <laughs> praise God. And so he says, you got it? Think on these things. Things that are lovely. We'll have it here in just a minute. Things that are pure. Things that are of a good report. Yeah. Praise God. When you think, yes. when you think, think on these things. Yes. Yes. While we're finding that, I was driving down the road from the church that I pastored in West, right on I-35 in Central Texas, south of, north of uh, Austin and south of Dallas. <laughs> Praise God. I was, I was, and I had an apostle in preaching for me from India. He was truly an apostle. Emmanuel Paul from India. He has a hundred churches and he was a banker of the highest caste in India. And then when he got saved and became a preacher, he was stoned and left for dead on the streets of Mandapeta. He gave up his entire great life in India. Here it is. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, I want to think on truth. Whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, just dig it out, find virtue, scratch and dig. It might be hard to find sometimes, but the apostles say, dig until you find some virtue. And if there be any praise, think on these things. Hallelujah. So you need to pray, and I need to pray for crop failure. On some of the bad things that I thought. We need to pray those crops dry up and wither away and blow, blow away. Because God has told us today, I, before you even planted a crop, I'm going to bless you. And so when the seeds are planted and the crop begins to come up, I want that to be the only thing in my field. Amen. Hallelujah. Because He has promised me a blessing. And so we're driving down the road, Emmanuel Paul. And for years of traveling, I have always said this one prayer until Emmanuel Paul got a hold of me. He didn't know this. He never traveled with me. But yet my wife will tell you that before we would leave our driveway, I would say, Lord, I'd take my little girl would bow her head to the back seat. And I'd say, let's pray. We're about to go preach, so let's pray. And I'd say, every time I had this repetitive prayer, Lord, we're going to preach. He's like, I know. I hear this all the time. He said, I said, Lord, now don't let us have any breakdowns, any flat tires, any accidents, and bring us home safely. And my little girl, amen, amen, praise God. <laughs> and so we're driving down the road. It's a dark night. We're in the dark car. And I got a little Philip with me in the back seat. A little evangelist that prayed through in my revival. And I was his pastor. And so we're driving along. Nobody's saying a word. All of a sudden, this apostle sitting on the pastor's side, said, Brother Sonye, he said, you ask God for many things. You ask God to not let you have any breakdowns, any flat tires, any accidents when you go preach. I'm like, I nearly had a wreck. I looked over at him. <laughs> How did you know that? And he said, you ask God all the time, let me cast out death. Let me heal the sick. Give me the gifts of the Spirit. I want to prophesy. I want to have a word of knowledge, God. And I, I, I always do. I say, Lord, let my, let my toolbox be full of everything I need to be a good minister. Lord. Give me everything. I want the whole, I want every, like my, my brother, my mechanic brother. I want the crescent wrenches and I want the box in and the open ends and I want the <laughs> torque wrench. I want it all. And that's a worthy request. <coughs> But I'm sitting here looking at him in the dark. And he said, in India, we get up in the morning and we just say, Lord, whatever you have for me, that's what I'll go do. And so somebody comes down the street and they need a devil cast out. And I just reach over and say, in Jesus' name, and I cast the devil out. It's a victory. I have a great rejoicing time. I praise the Lord. Say, thank you, Jesus, you let me cast out a devil today. He said, when somebody comes in and they bring their baby to us in the morning and they say, my baby is dead and the baby's there cold, stiff, and they lay him on the table at our house 
and they say, you preach to us that your God was the one true God when you were preaching on the street. And so if he is, out of the 330 million gods that we worship, Emmanuel Paul, if your God is the true God, he will raise my baby from the dead. And he said, we pray until that baby gets his breath back and raises from the dead. Because, and then they accept Jesus and we baptize him and they're filled with the Holy Ghost because they say he is the true living God. But brother Sonny, everything to you is a defeat because if you don't cast devils out that day, you feel defeated. If you don't prophesy, you feel defeated. Get up in the morning, brother Sonny, and just say, Lord, whatever you have for me, I'm available. Praise God, folks. Could you imagine what life would be like when we don't feel defeated all the time? Right. Amen. Because God said, I have blessed you before you plant one thing. Hallelujah. An example of what I'm talking about today, it's a pretty good teaching today, isn't it? Amen. 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 I'm thankful to be here to be able to share this with you. Amen. Malachi, the third chapter, says, Son, should people cheat God? This is New Living Translation. Yet you have cheated me. But, but you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? He said, you've cheated me in tithes and offerings due to me. You're under a curse for the whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. Now, I, I want to get past that, right? Because I don't hear a lot of talk about money around. I don't hear any moaning and groaning about we need this and taking up two or three offerings. Uh, you know, I, this is not any reflection on that. This is simply to say, I have given you a blessing and I want to bless you today. So it, had, it has little to do with anything else other than the whole, the whole sphere of our life God wants to bless. But I happen to be using this scripture today because listen to this. He said, try me. Yeah. Prove me. Yeah. He said, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. So see, our first response, now I'm pastor, and so I know a lot of times the first response of some of the people is, oh my, he's preaching about money again. When we started our last church, and one of my son pastors, son-in-law pastors right now, I went over to a brother's house to visit him, and, and, and I didn't say a word to him. I went there to just love him. And the first thing he said was, if you preach about money, I ain't coming. <laughs> well, the worst thing you can tell a Pentecostal preacher is what to preach and what not to preach. Because we preach what God gives us. And so I said, brother, I love you. But I'm, listen, there's a whole lot of scriptures in that Bible on money. And if God wakes me up and gives me want something to preach on you, I'm preaching it. I want you to be here. But if you have to leave, then you have to leave. But we're going to preach what God gives us. But listen to this. The way this man should have responded to me. Was he said, I will, God said, I will open the windows of heaven. Yeah. And I will pour you out a blessing yeah. that your bank vault ain't big enough to hold. That's, right. That's what it says in the Texas language of it. Right. But he said, I'll open the windows of heaven to you and I will pour out a blessing so great right. that you won't have enough room to take it in. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Put me to the test. Yeah. Oh, I love you, Jesus. Yeah. You're so exciting to preach about. I just, I tell you, I'm just so happy and giddy about getting to preach the word of the Lord today. Because, see, God said, if you will give, He said, I'm going to give you back so much that you won't be able to, the, the windows of heaven are going to be open. And I'm going to, He said, and then God goes as far to say, why don't you put me to the test and see if that's not true? That's what I feel like telling atheists. Amen. When I talk to an atheist, I don't believe in atheists. But when I talk to a person that says they're an atheist or an agnostic, I, I, I tell them, and here's what I like to tell them, I dare you to give your life to Jesus. If He's not real, you don't have anything to lose. But if He is real, you've got everything to gain. So I dare you to just say, Jesus Christ is Lord. And watch what happens in your life. God's going to begin to bless you. You're going to get joy. So listen, I dare you to do it. That's what God said. He said, don't fight my word. He said, but I dare you to put me to the test. If you give, I'll give you so much back, you won't even be able to contain it. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. 
So your crops, he said, your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from insects and disease. He, he, he didn't say go to Ace Hardware and buy a Roundup. He said, if you'll do this, I will keep bugs off your grapes. And I'll protect them from disease. And he said, and your grapes will not fall off before they're ripe. And I have this picture in my mind of this Christian grape field. I mean, acres and acres of grapes. And a hurricane comes blowing through. And 60, 70, 80 mile an hour winds. And those grapes are hanging on for dear life. Because God said, not one grape is going to come off of your vine until they're ripe. How many has had hurricanes hit your life lately? And you're bowed over and you're struggling. Listen, today, this day forth, God says to you, not one grape is going to fall off your vine. I don't care how hard the winds blow. Y'all have to forgive my craziness when I preach. When I pray for people, I, I, I have to warn them. You know, when we pray for somebody, I tell them, I'm going to get a little funky here. I'm going to get crazy when I pray. Because I'm probably not going to say a word. I'm just going, oh, shh. And I know it looks stupid. I try not to do it. Somebody asked me, they said, why do you, shh, when you were preaching? I said, because, friend, I get so full that i got to let the air out every now and then. Amen. When I pray for people, man, it's like Lee Stone King said one time, he said, I love it when a woman comes up to our dear sister Sale, so, so such an elegant lady. I was telling your son last night, you're such a beautiful lady. You remind me of my mother. But Lee Stone King would love to get a hold of your hair. Because <laughs> he, said, he said, when I lay hands on a woman, he said, I just shake up a hair. He said, I know it's, it doesn't make me more powerful, but I feel more powerful. <laughs> And so somewhere along the lines of my ministry, all this, shh, 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 shh. but I feel virtue flowing. I feel virtue flowing. Hallelujah. And God says to you today, oh, though the winds blow with gale force, not those grapes are commanded by me to hang on. They will not come off of that vine until they're ripe. And the insects are going to die. If they bite that grape, they're going to die. Because I've commanded the incense to stay off of your... Do you believe this this morning? Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Will you receive this this morning? Amen. Hallelujah. I feel you receiving it. I feel you receiving it. Talk about those things. Don't talk about how pitiful life is. Don't talk about how terrible things are. You, you're authorized to do that when you get a prayer request. You can say, pray for this. Pray for that. People, people need to know that. But the rest of the day... Just say, God, I thank you that I'm walking in health. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that I am I am a survivor. I thank you, Lord God, that I am that I'm the devil's worst nightmare. Because I have faith. Oh, this is so exciting. He said that all the nations will call you blessed. I told you that last night, Brother Sales. The people in Sweetwater, I felt that as a word from the Lord. That you have no idea the people in Sweetwater look at you and say, what a man of God. They look at Pastor Jeremy and say, this is a man of God. He's weathered the storms. And he's standing tall. Praise God. Your influence is greater than you can imagine. Amen. When you live the way that I'm talking about living, when it's all about Jesus, it's all about the Lord, it's all about the blessings of God, even when they're not there, even when the seed is not in the field. Praise God. Praise God. 60 mile an hour winds can blow and they won't bother you. The people of Israel had just come out of 70 years of captivity. And I'm, I'll be closing here in just a minute. The people of Israel had just come out of 70 years of captivity when this word was spoken by Haggai. They had no self-confidence. Yeah. They, they were destroyed in their emotions and in their spirit. And now Haggai says, I've got a word from God. Yeah. Now, he prophesied 
uh, two other times on December 24th. He prophesied two times on the same day. And I was reading the commentary. J. Vernon McGee said that somebody asked me. They said, why did Haggai prophesy two to times on December 24th instead of one time? He said, I guess he wanted to go home for Christmas. <laughs> and he said, I got a scathing letter in the mail that said, J. Vernon, you're crazy. They didn't even have Christmas back then. <laughs> Praise God. This was Old Testament. Jesus hadn't even been born in flesh yet. Hallelujah. But you get the point today. Hallelujah. He says that I'm going to bless you even before the crops are in the field. Oh, I feel so good about this because I know that God has given you a word today. And I want to read real quickly Deuteronomy 28th chapter verse 1 through 14. It shall come to pass. Look at your neighbor and say, it shall come to pass. If thou hearken, I told you it was contingent upon your obedience. He said, you know, he said, bring the tithes to the storehouse. First, you've got to obey. You've got to do it. You can't, you can't just say, I want to receive the windows of heaven open and I want to receive a blessing that I can't contain all that and never bring the tithes into the storehouse or the offerings, whatever it may be. You first have to plant the seed there. But in this case, God is saying, I'm going to bless you before the seed comes out of the barn. But you do have to receive this word and you begin to have to think differently and act differently because he said, it shall come to pass if you hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Somebody ought to be shouting about halfway through this reading. He said, because if you observe these things, these commandments, which I command you this day, I'm about to command something to you. And if you'll observe them, the Lord God will set thee on high. Amen. I had a man prophesy to me one day. He, he could not wait to give me the word that God had given him for me. It's in the book of Psalms. I need to find it because it's a word for me. He said, Brother Kathy, he said, I saw the devil attacking you. He said he was coming after you with a vengeance. But he said you were so high above him that he could not reach you. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And God, to back that up, God said, I will set you on high. Above all the nations of the earth. Amen. You. You. Sweetwater. You. And he said, and all these blessings are going to come on you. Now I'm about to read them. And I want you to receive them as I read them. All these blessings are going to come upon you. He said, blessed shalt thou be in the city. When you drive into Sweetwater, you out of town country folk. When you drive into Sweetwater, you just need to look up and say, God's going to bless me in the sick. Amen. God is going to bless me in the field. Your labor, your work, whatever it is. God, he said, blessed shall be the fruit of thy body. Hallelujah. The fruit of my body. Blessed is the fruit of my ground. And the fruit of my cattle. This is all to do with for those of us who don't raise cattle and all. This all has to do with our prosperity, our blessings that God has given us. Whatever that might be. He said, blessed shall be the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be the basket and the store. Blessed shall thou be when you come in. And blessed shall thou be when you come out. When you go out. I preached a conference in Jamaica. In uh, Spalding, Jamaica. And there was a lady from Florida that they had booked to preach also, Donna Mattis. She's on my Facebook. And so Donna preached before I did. And she preached one of my favorite passages of Scripture. She preached about how Zacchaeus climbed the tree as Jesus passed through Jericho. I love preaching that. And she he climbed the tree to look at Jesus, see Jesus, got right in Jesus' face in His way. Hey Amen. Jesus, you're not passing me because I need a blessing. And so Jesus looked up and said, This day... Salvation's come to your house. I'm, go I'm coming home with you, Zacchaeus. And she preached a message because evidently Zacchaeus was on the other side of town when Jesus was going out of Jericho. And she preached. Her title of her message was, I missed him coming in, but I'm catching him going out. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so you might be on the back side of the blessing, but friend, you missed him coming in, but you're going to catch him going out. You're 70 now. You're 65 now. That's okay. God said from this day forth, I'm going to bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. He said, the Lord shall cause thy enemies that rise up against you to be smitten before thy face. He said, they shall come against you one way and they're going to flee another seven ways. Believe that. 
That person on the job that's trying to get you fired. That person in your life that is marginalizing you and trying to hold you back. God said they're going to come against you one way, but I'm going to make them flee seven ways. Hallelujah. And he said, the Lord shall cause your enemies to be spent before your face. The Lord shall command the blessing. God has commanded a blessing on Sweetwater Day. He said, you go there today. Bless him, and you do what I tell you to do in, this, in the life of these people from Sweetwater. Do you hear me, blessing? I'm commanding you to go there. In every life and every person that is in this building today. He said, He'll command a blessing upon you in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thine all that thou settest thine hand to do. Wow. And he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee in holy people unto himself. He has sworn, as he has sworn unto thee, if thou keep the commandments yes. of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. Yes. Right. Contingent. Right. It's contingent. Right. Yeah. But who would want it? Yeah. Who couldn't just get a grip on yourself? I, you know what makes me so mad? Is, is when I think about Planned Parenthood and I think about uh, all the money that's being spent, taxpayers' money that's being spent to tell young people we're going to pass out we're going to pass out condoms to your young people. We are going to give them abortion on demand. What you know what they're telling our kids? They're telling them you're animals and you can't control your lust, so we're going to try to help you. That offends me. That offends me to think that they're, they think my kid cannot contain themselves. Amen. Because the Bible said God's going to bless the fruit of your womb. He's going to bless your children. Amen. We need to prophesy over our children. They are going to be abstinent. They are not animals. They can't control their functions. And I believe in them enough to say that they can do that. Hallelujah. I'm not going to say, you, here, let me give you this because I know you're going to go out and do these things. No, I believe you're not going to. Praise God. Amen. And so he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open the good treasure. Oh, God. He said, the Lord shall open unto you his good treasure. Amen. And he said, he's going to Cause the heavens to give rain unto the land in its season, and to bless all the work of thine hand, and thou shalt lend unto many and nations, not and not borrow. Right. Amen. You're supposed to be the lender, not the borrower. Right. Amen. And he said, And the Lord shall make thee the head, not the tail, and thou shalt be above only, and not beneath, if thou wilt hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe them, and to do them. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words that I command thee this day on the right hand or the left to go after other gods to serve them. Amen. That's what he said. Now, I'm not going to read the next part of the chapter that says if you don't do this, you're going to get everything under the sun. Because I just, I'm with God. I have enough faith and confidence to know that Sweetwater's not even going to have to go to that part of the book. Because they're going to say I receive the blessings of God in my life today. Praise God. Praise God. And so today as an evangelist, I come to you and say, this ought to get you saved. Yes. Because you'd be a fool to say, I don't want the blessings of God. And I close with my fa one of my favorite Bible characters. God told Abraham, he said, if you will leave the land of the Ur of Chaldees, if you will leave Iraq, the land of the Ur of Chaldees, the Chaldees, that's Iraq today. Amen. His father, Terah, worshipped Allah. He was called the moon god, but it's the same god. Allah is not an invention of Muhammad. Allah was the moon god in Iraq. And so now today, they are still worshipping the moon god. Allah is what his name is today. Amen. But God said, Abraham, if you will leave that and separate yourself, God, God will do two things for an individual. He will first elect you and then He will separate you. And there will be many separations throughout your life as God 
purifies you. It brings you into the place that He wants to bring you. There will be one election and many separations as you grow toward God. You won't be able to hang out some of the places you used to have. You won't be able to go to some of the places. Not because the pastor said, don't do that. Because God is leading you and bringing you into purification and holiness and sanctification. And so He said, if you'll leave Abraham, I'll make you great. I'll make you famous. Everybody will know your name. He said, I'll, he said, all your enemies that curse you, I'm going to curse them. And he said, no, you, I'm going to bless you where nobody can ever curse you. I'm going to bless you. And he said, I'm going to make your name famous. Praise God. What's Abraham going to say? I don't want none of that. No, the natural response was, I'm leaving God. I'm catching the first train out. And that ought to be our attitude in Sweetwater today. God, I receive this blessing. This is a word from God today, folks. I'm telling you, this is a supernatural day that God has said, I, you mark it down. Remember, he said, you mark it down because you're the temple now. And because you are laying the foundation of the temple in your life today in Sweetwater, I am going to bless you from this day forth. Stand with me right now if you would. Praise God. This is exciting. This is an exciting day tonight. Because when trials come your way, you can know.